Way back in 2004, at the North American International Auto Show in Detroit, Michigan, Ford revealed its retro-inspired fifth-generation Mustang, codenamed the S197. With its large circle headlights, five-spoke wheels, and classic muscle car lines, this Mustang paid serious homage to the iconic Mustangs of the late 1960s. The GT version came with a 4.6-liter V8 that produced 300 horsepower, which helped make it the quickest new car you could buy under $30,000 in 2005. But what really makes this car special is that it set the trend for the next generation of muscle cars as Dodge and Chevy followed suit by reintroducing the Challenger in 2008 and the Camaro in 2010, both of which unmistakably inspired by the vehicular nostalgia of America's yesteryear. I first saw this Mustang way back in 2004 in Car and Driver magazine and instantly fell in love with it. I was only making like 8 bucks an hour at the time, so I could only afford this car on Forza where I spent hundreds of hours modifying and racing this car online. Many years Years later, when I finally paid off all my student loans and was able to afford one of these, Ford, Dodge, and Chevy were now all building cars that made well over 400 horsepower, essentially making the 463 valve Mustang obsolete and often a point of ridicule. But in May of 2017, I bought one anyway with the goal of making it great again. And recently I just completed stage 3, which includes some major upgrades like forged internals, high lift cams, a T56 Magnum transmission, and some really proper tuning. So in this video, I'm going to break down everything that's been done to this underdog so far, reveal how much power it makes with its current setup, race it against an array of muscle cars including a Dodge Viper, a Camaro SS, and a 2021 Mustang GT with a 10-speed automatic transmission. Then finally, I'll talk about the big plans for it going forward in stage 4. The first upgrades this Mustang received was a cold air intake, a pipe bomb axle back, and a Bama tune. These basic bro mods enabled the Mustang to put down 292 wheel horsepower and 307 pound foot of torque, which was a pretty respectable increase over stock. In stage 2, the Mustang got a full exhaust system from Cooks that included long tube headers, high flow cats, and an X pipe. I also installed a new intake manifold with shorter runners from Ford Performance, larger throttle body, and underdrive pulley upgraded coils, and a lighter one-piece aluminum drive shaft. These mods, in combination with a dyno tune, enabled the Mustang to put down 327 wheel horsepower and 339 pound-foot of torque, or about a 12% increase over Stage 1. Stage 3 began with some cosmetic upgrades, including a California Special Bumper, along with a modified GT500 front splitter and some side splitters to match. I also customized some aftermarket headlights, installed a ducktail spoiler, and had the deck lid shaved for that super clean look. I think these visual mods turned out pretty well. Things got more serious when I installed a set of Detroit Rocker camshafts. These gave the car a pretty dope lope. And after another dyno tune, bumped the power up to 363 wheel horsepower, which was about 100 horsepower over stock and on par with its 5.0 successor. Now this is where I should have closed the chapter on stage 3 and just made this video, but instead I took on the foolish goal of trying to squeeze 400 wheel horsepower out of the Mustang before boosting it, and this is where things started to get a little crazy. So I knew that the engine was eventually going to have to be rebuilt with stronger parts since these old 3 valve engines can't handle much over 500 horsepower. So in preparation for my turbo kit, I went full send and ordered a Ford stroker kit from MMR that included a 3.8 inch stroker crankshaft, manly H-beams, and dished aluminum pistons. These internals can handle over a thousand horsepower and would increase the Mustang's displacement to 4.9 liters. I also purchased this dazzling pair of ported cylinder heads from Livernoy that flow about 25% better than the stock heads and came with stainless steel valves and stiffer springs good for 7800 RPM. I also picked up a pair of the most aggressive off-the-shelf cams available for three-valve Mustangs, Comp Cams 127-600s. And finally, I ordered a complete return-style fuel system from On3 Performance and 1000cc injectors from Deechworks. Street to Sand in Reno, Nevada did the rebuild for me, and after seven weeks and $9,000, I had my car back. miles after the rebuild, the Mustang was able to put down 387 wheel horsepower and 353 pound foot of torque. I was hoping the Mustang would break the 400 level, but I've read that sometimes it takes a while for freshly built engines to reach their potential. Regardless, I figured it was time to put the Mustang to a test, so I set up a friendly race with a full bolt-on LS3 Camaro that made almost 450 wheel horsepower at the time. So while not exactly a fair fight, I was curious to see what the Mustang could do. While the 
Mustang held up okay-ish in first and second gear once I shifted into third. I didn't stand a chance. Not only was the gearing on my Mustang way too long, but I was also having a really hard time getting the 5-speed manual transmission to go into second gear. I knew my transmission was on its way out. So I ordered the ultimate 6-speed manual transmission to replace it, a Tremec T56 Magnum XL. These transmissions can handle over 1,000 horsepower and 700 pound-foot of torque and were used in high-power muscle cars like the Shelby GT500 and the 5th Gen Dodge Viper. I paired the Magnum with a twin-disc clutch from McLeod and shorter 410 axle gears to improve acceleration. I installed all the parts myself to save money and made a pretty detailed video on the conversion process for fellow Mustang owners considering the swap. The new drivetrain resulted in crisp, predictable shifts and made banging gears at 7,000 RPM no big deal. Street to sand to have the Mustang's tune recalibrated for the new transmission and to find out if the new lighter flywheel and clutch assembly freed up any horsepower. I asked Dustin to push the Mustang to its limit by targeting an air fuel ratio of 12.8 and to just keep adding timing until it stops making power. After Dustin worked his magic, the Mustang put down an impressive 408 wheel horsepower and 363 pound foot of torque. There's very few naturally aspirated three valves in the world making over 400 wheel horsepower on 91 octane. So big props to dust and its street to sand for squeezing this kind of power out of a low compression NA three valve. Now we're gonna race a few muscle cars that would normally leave my Mustang in the dust to see if I have in fact made this Mustang great again. Every race will feature a car that is more powerful and faster than the one before it. And yes, while my Mustang is modified, all the cars that we'll be racing still have higher compression and displacement. Our first race is against a lightly modded 2001 Chevy Corvette with a 6-speed manual transmission. These 5th gen Corvettes are powered by a 5.7 liter V8 LS1 that generates 350 horsepower and 375 pound-foot of torque at the crank. This particular C5 has a cold air intake and exhaust, so it's probably making slightly more than that. This is also the lightest car we'll be racing today, and according to Car and Driver, it's more than capable of a low 13 second quarter mile. Next up is the successor to my Mustang, a 2014 Mustang GT with a first-gen Coyote engine. This 5-liter dual overhead cam V8 produces 420 horsepower and 390 pound-foot of torque at the crank. It's equipped with a 6-speed manual and is good for a 13.1 second quarter mile. Our next race is against my best friend's 2015 Camaro SS1 LE. It's powered by an LS3, which is a 6.2 liter pushrod V8 that produces 426 horsepower and 420 pound-foot of torque at the crank. These 5th gen 1LEs were only available with a manual transmission, and this is the only car we'll be racing today with shorter gearing than my Mustang. Next up is a 2019 Mustang Bullet, which is a special Mustang that pays tribute to the classic Mustang GT Fastback that Steve McQueen drove in the 1968 film Bullet. It's powered by a third generation Coyote engine that gets the upgraded intake manifold, throttle body, and airbox from the Shelby GT350. This allows the Bullet to generate an impressive 480 horsepower and 420 pound-foot of torque at the crank. It's only available with a six-speed manual transmission, and according to Car and Driver, the Bullet can do the quarter mile in 12.6 seconds. The most powerful car we'll be racing today is also the oldest. This is my 2000 Dodge Viper GTS, and it's powered by a tuned 8-liter V10 that makes somewhere around 500 horsepower and over 500 pound-foot of torque at the crank. I don't know what it does the quarter in, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did it in under 12 seconds. The 
Wing puts up a pretty decent fight, but with the aerodynamics of a refrigerator and the Viper's big boy torque, it never really had a chance. Now all the cars we've raced so far have been manuals, which means each car's performance has been pretty dependent on when and how quickly the driver shifted gears. So I know there's one more car we need to race, a 6th gen Mustang GT with a 10 speed automatic transmission. This is the fastest new Mustang you can buy today outside of the GT500 and the soon to go on sale S650. But first I returned to Street to Sand for a quick checkup just to make sure everything was good, only to find out it wasn't. The Mustang was down about 60 wheel horsepower from its peak, and the dyno chart had this unusual waviness to it. And weirdly, most of the diagnostic data looked fine. Even the compression test results looked good. With no obvious clues from the data logs and lack of engine codes, I did a basic tune-up that consisted of new spark plugs and coil packs, an air filter, and an oil change. When I returned to the dyno, the Mustang did make a little more power, but it was still down about 10% from its peak. So I cut open the old oil filter to look for engine damage, and I did find a few bits of metal. I wasn't sure if this was enough to be a concern, but after some googling, I did start to panic a little. I hoisted the engine up a few inches so I could drop the oil pan and check out the rod bearings. And while they did have more wear than I expected, it wasn't anything catastrophic. I went ahead and replaced the rod bearings, then I removed the front cover so I could inspect the timing components. And that's where I found something interesting. The chain tensioner should be easily compressible like the one you see here, but the right hand tensioner was completely stuck open. Even with all my strength, I could barely compress it. My thought was maybe this failed tensioner was throwing off timing on the right bank just enough to lose power, but not enough to throw any codes. So I replaced all the timing chain components, along with new VCT solenoids, camshaft and crankshaft position sensors, and O2 sensors. And since I had to remove the transmission to drop the oil pan, I also installed the new clutch from Center Force with a single organic disc that's good for almost 700 pound-foot of torque. This clutch uses a centrifugal weight on the pressure plate to apply extra clamping force at high RPMs but otherwise provides the smooth engagement of a stock clutch under normal driving. And while the RXT twin disc I had before was great for lightning quick power shifts, it's less than ideal for daily driving as you have to rev up the engine and carefully modulate the clutch pedal every time you take off from a stop. And finally, I also upgraded the fuel pumps because on long drives, I did notice that my fuel pressure would start to drop off. After triple checking that I installed the timing components correctly, I got to work reinstalling the front cover and all of its pulleys, the valve covers, intake manifold, fuel rails, throttle body, and intake. Then it was finally time to fire the Mustang up and take it for a test drive. But unfortunately, I could tell from the sound of the exhaust that something was still off. I took the Stang back to street to sand anyway, hoping it was just a tuning issue. And of course it wasn't. The engine was running so lean, Dustin didn't even feel comfortable doing a dyno pull. But at least there was a clear problem this time. The Mustang's computer was trying to add significantly more fuel to the engine's left bank. And since I had just replaced the plugs and coils, I had a strong hunch it was an injector. So I took my injectors to a shop called Blazing Wrenches in Sparks, Nevada to have them flow tested and clean. They provided a before and after report which clearly showed I had a clogged injector. I reinstalled the freshly cleaned injectors and could immediately tell the car was running way better. Before heading back to Street to Sand for the 17th time, I topped off the Stang with some premium racing oil from Motul to better protect the bearings and valve train going forward. This oil is specifically designed to provide extra protection under hard driving. And considering how I drive... pretty much most of the time. Badass manufacturers like Roof and Gunther Works exclusively use Motul to protect their high revving engines, so I reckon it's good enough for my 7000 RPM 3 valve. I spent half a day driving around monitoring the Mustang's diagnostics and performance in real world conditions. Then Dustin dialed in the tune on the dyno, and after a bunch of test runs, the Mustang was ultimately able to put down 410 wheel horsepower and 364 pound foot of torque, the most it's ever made. But now that the Mustang is finally running great again, it's time for it to face its ultimate challenge. This 2021 Mustang GT is powered by a third gen Coyote engine that's rated for 460 horsepower and 420 pound foot of torque at the crank. But what really makes this car special is that it has a 10 speed automatic transmission that enables it to do the quarter mile in just 12.1 seconds. That's a half second faster than its manual counterpart and a tenth quicker than the Shelby GT350, making it the second fastest Mustang on the market as of late 2022. 
On a dyno, these Mustangs usually make around 415 wheel horsepower, which means that even with all the mods my 4.6 Mustang has, a stock third gen Coyote still puts a little more power to the ground. And admittedly, after making this chart, I got so worried about losing that the night before the race, I crudely constructed this Ram Air headlight from some plumbing material I found at Home Depot. I had learned from all those tuning sessions that my Mustang was super sensitive to intake air temps, so keeping my IITs down could actually make a difference in this race. We're going to start the first race at 25 miles per hour and go to about 130. This will take my Mustang from the middle of first gear to the top of fourth. Mustang initially rockets forward a few car lengths and is able to maintain that gap for the duration of the race. No doubt this result surprised me, so for the second race, we're going to increase our starting speed to 50 miles per hour, which will start me in second gear instead of first. This race was much more evenly matched, and while I'm doing my best to shift as quickly as possible, the 10-speed Mustang is able to put about a half car length on me around 130 miles per hour. So what's on the menu in stage 4? Well first off, the brakes and suspension on my Mustang are terrible, so I'll be upgrading to this gorgeous set of coilovers from Solvers and installing a big brake kit from Brembo that includes 15-inch rotors and massive six-piston calipers. Then this 77mm billet turbo, the pièce de résistance of this whole project, will finally be installed. You can expect full how-to installation videos along with races against significantly faster cars like a supercharged Corvette, a Shelby GT500, and definitely a Tesla.